Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO of AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. This Week at Work is the only show about the workplace that offers you front row seats and a microphone featuring experts in human resources and employment law to bring you practical, timely, and accurate insights so you can more effectively lead your organization. It's Thursday, May 2nd, episode 277. Today, in the words of HubSpot's culture code, culture is to recruiting as product is to marketing, but culture is often misunderstood. And that's what special guest Eric Stone discovered after exploring why he and his organization were continuing to outperform the competition. And lucky for us, he's not being stingy with his findings. From empowerment, development, and trust to cultural structure, Author Stone is here to help you jumpstart your workplace culture. Enjoy a conversation on culture killers and the five factors to engagement. All this and more on This Week at Work. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Happy to have you. Good morning, Burt Garland. Where are you at today? Good morning, Phil. I am in Washington, D.C., uh, actually at the, the hotel where Ronald Reagan was shot and uh, many years ago, I think back in, what, 1981 or 82, and uh, where the White House course, press correspondence dinner was last weekend. Okay. Is that the building behind you there? That is. That is the very building. All right. Well, very good. I hope you're going to be back in time for our leadership conference uh, next week. We got you a seat saved at the uh, at the VIP table. You know, I wouldn't miss it. There's no way. All right. Well, we, we are looking forward to that. Uh, we do have a special guest with us today, Eric Stone. Eric, good morning. How are you today? Good morning, gentlemen. I'm doing great. I, I am on the, the Connecticut side of this, the, the area here, Connecticut Shore. All right, so we're bringing the East Coast right to you today. We got you covered. Um, Eric is the author of Jumpstart Your Workplace Culture, former employee of all the enterprise brands, it sounds like, from our pre-conversation. Uh, so we're going to get into uh, what Eric has learned and what he's doing today um, with his book, Jumpstart Your Culture. Um, Eric, welcome to the program. Uh, Bert and I have our routine, and we're going to get into Lawyer on the Clock once I introduce some questions here for today. And they are all culture related. Well done there, Nick. Uh, the first question that we have for our audience is uh, what word comes to mind when someone says culture killer? Uh, and uh, I have heard that. I don't know if I've ever said it myself, but I have heard people go, oh, that's a culture killer. Uh, so that's our word cloud question. Uh, our second question is which of these five drivers of employee engagement do you think is most impactful? And then we give you some options to select from. And then finally, do you believe a blueprint to success exists for the current workplace? Um, you know, I would say that there is a blueprint, um, but within that blueprint, uh, you can use different components to achieve the workplace design that you're looking for. So my answer is yes. Uh, however, I'm curious uh, to what our audience thinks on that blueprint. Uh, Bert, are you ready? I'm ready, Phil. All right. Hey, by the way, I hear you're going to go leave our program here um, once you're done and go do a different podcast. Uh, is that something our audience should know about? Uh, it'll be on, uh, not today, or I'm not quite sure when, but, uh, we're, we're doing many podcasts on the various topics that we're talking about at, uh, my firm's national seminar here in Washington, DC. We've got about, uh, over 600 clients in attendance and, uh, I think over 80 sessions and, uh, I'm speaking at two of them and, uh, we'll be doing, uh, podcasts for those. So I'll let you know when those are issued. All right. But they're not live, not like this one. Not live like this one, correct. All right. All right, Bert. We're going to put you on the clock. Nick, are you ready to pull that lever? All right. It's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're on the clock. So I'm going to talk about one topic very, very briefly today, and then I'm going to do a little bit deeper dive than Tom did last week on the DOL's new overtime rule. The first I wanted to talk about and just mention, and we'll probably do a deeper dive on this in one of the upcoming programs, Phil, is that the EEOC, uh, as I've mentioned before on the program, was in the process of updating its uh, harassment guidance. Uh, the EEOC on April 29th, just a few days ago, did finalize its uh, new harassment guidance. It's the first update to its harassment guidance in a quarter century. 
And it really does kind of give the document greater relevance in today's workplace, as well as uh, chances of, of additional lawsuits to challenge uh, the, this new harassment guidance. This uh, guidance, like I said, that was issued on April 29th, reinforces uh, LGBTQ plus uh, employee rights, like allowing the use of bathrooms that fit a worker's gender identity and protection from misgendering, in addition to outlining how employers can tackle harassment that occurs in the virtual workplace and through social media. Just wanna mention that this is really the, the EEO's second attempt uh, to, to update its harassment guidance. They tried in 2017 and that failed. Uh, and so the, up got, the harassment guidance hasn't been dated, updated since 1999. So I uh, just want to mention that, like I said, I think at some point it probably makes sense maybe next week or the following week to do a deeper dive into what that harassment guidance, uh, the updates mean for employers like I'm going to do as I transition over to the DOL uh, guidance that was released or the final rule that was released last week. How about that, Phil? All right. Hey, you go get some practice and then you bring it back here for perfection, okay? Perfect. That's what I always and, try to and, do. And for all of our listeners, it's not guidance on harassment. It's guidance not to harass what we cannot, should not, and will not do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, Phil. That's right. right. Okay, <laughs> so, very good. All right, so let's. Uh, t I know, like I said, Tom uh, Chibnall from my firm last week uh, mentioned about the new overtime rule uh, that was it went into effect. The final rule on April twenty three, two thousand twenty four. That was the day it was issued. It's not in effect yet. Uh, and and I know Phil, I've been getting a ton of questions about it. My firm has. I know you guys at AIM have. Yep. And uh, so so you and I thought it would make a, a sense to do a little bit deeper dive. So. Uh, the department on April 23rd did issue its highly anticipated final rule to really change substantially the minimum salary threshold uh, and highly compensated employee threshold under the Fair Labor Standards Act. The important pieces are that on July 1 of this year, so just uh, what, two months away, uh, the minimum salary threshold is going to go up by 23.4% uh, over the current threshold. And then on January 1, 2025, another increase is set to take place, resulting in a 64.9% increase over the present day. The Department of Labor has estimated that the change to the overtime rules could impact up to 4 million employees. So that's uh, pretty substantial. Uh, the highly compensated threshold is going to increase from $107,432 to $132,964 on July 1, and then to $151,164 on July, January 1 of 2025. And then very importantly, the final rule also implements a virtually automatic update to each threshold that will occur every three years beginning on July 1, 2027. So like I said, some very significant Changes And I think to, to sort of appreciate the changes, it's worth kind of talking just a little bit about uh, the history of all of this. Of course, the Fair Labor Standards Act sets the rules that determine if an employee is eligible to receive overtime if they're non-exempt or not required to receive overtime if, if they're exempt. And the salary thresholds set by the FLSA are really the minimum salary amounts at which point a covered employee becomes exempt from receiving overtime. So right now, what we look at is in order to classify someone ex as exempt, the employees really have to pass three tests. They have to be paid on a salary or fee basis. The salary or fee basis must exceed the minimum, which currently is $684 per week. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, the changes. And then three, a job duties test. And so I want to point out one very significant thing. This new rule, the new final rule, does not change the job duties test. So the job to duties test that we've been looking at for uh, exemptions under the executive, administrative, professional, and outside sales and computer employees, those duties tests are not changing at all. What is changing is the salary or fee basis that, like I said, the minimum is currently 684 per week. And what those changes exactly are is that um, the, the changes are going from 684 a week to 1,128 per week, uh, or the, equivalents of the equivalent of 58,656 
by January 1, 2024. Now, I also mentioned uh, 2025. I also mentioned that there is that interim step, though, uh, where the, the salary basis is going up to um, uh, on July 1 of this year, so just two months away, to an interim amount of $47,476 or nine, I'm sorry, for about $46,000. Uh, uh, and, and so that's, that is going to be a very significant change. There is that interim step in there uh, that we need to, to keep my, be mindful of. So talking about the history of it, the minimum salary for exempt staff last, was updated uh, all the way back in 2004 and was set at $455 per week or 23,660 per year. That remained unchanged all the way up until 2016 when President Obama, uh, his Department of Labor doubled the minimum salary for exempt staff to 913 per week or 47,476 per year. So that rule in 2016 though, it never went into effect because there were strong challenges to that and a federal judge stopped that proposed threshold taking place just days before its December 1, 2016 effective date. Uh, so then in 2019, the Department of Labor announced a new rule for January 1, 2020, and that set the minimum salary at the current 684 per week uh, or 35,568 per year. That went into effect on January 1, 2020. Um, and so again, this, this marks the first time since January 1, 2020, when the salary threshold has been adjusted. Um, I do expect legal challenges to this. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens because basically the, the rule by taking this two-step approach under this current rule by doing this interim increase in July uh, that, that jumps it up to, I, I gave you the wrong number before, that jumps it up to 43,888. Uh, by taking that two-step process, July 1 and then January 1 of next year, uh, the July 1 increase really follows the methodology that the Trump administration used in the 2019 overtime regulation, which went into effect on January 1, 2020, and there were no legal challenges to that. That one did go into effect, and, and so this new rule under the Biden DOL looks a lot like that. Uh, for the July 1 increase. Now, the July, uh, the January 1, 2025 increase looks a little bit different, and that's where I expect to see the legal challenges take place. Uh, and so we'll have to see what shakes out with that. There are business groups who are talking about doing. What will be interesting to me is, is I, my, my, my gut tells me, here's my prediction, my crystal ball for you, Phil. My gut tells me that the increase for July 1 is going to go into effect. And so that means employers need to really start looking right now at their classifications of employees. And then I do think the legal challenges will work their way through. Uh, and I'm not quite sure, I'm not as confident that the January 1, 2025 uh, portion of the rule will actually go into effect. Just based on the fact that it's too much, too, too quick. Well, it, it also contains some mechanisms that look a lot more like the Obama rule uh, for adjusting the uh, increases over time. Uh, the, the, yeah. the rule that was challenged in 2016 uh, and was stopped by the court. So I do think that there's a chance that that portion of it uh, gets gets struck down. Okay, very good. Hey, Bert, uh, just a couple questions before you go. And I know sure. you're, you're in a little bit of a, a time crunch here. Yeah. One of the qu common questions I get is, well, this person's title is a manager. Um, you know, uh, they, they, they don't really manage any people, but they manage, you know, they're a manager. Work. They, yeah, they, they manage, manage work. They, they manage work, uh, but they're, they're below the threshold. Um, um, what am I okay because they're a manager? That's a very common question, yeah. um, and you know I think that answer is no. But can you just talk about that for a minute? Yeah, of course, that is a common question. And so yeah, they have to meet those three tests that I gave you before. They have to be paid on a salary basis. Mm -hmm. They have to be paid at least the minimum threshold, which is currently six eighty four, but it's going up significantly under the new rule. And then they have to meet the duties test. And so, like I said, this new rule is not changing the duties test, but just because someone is called a manager and they manage work, it does not mean that they actually are an exempt employee. 
right. there's a test you have to go through and an, and an analysis that you have to go through under the rule, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, to determine if the person truly is an exempt employee. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I think the other question, and it's probably going to get into the duties test, and and I know our hotline can help with that. Um, your your firm can help as well. But is okay. Well, the person gets paid a bonus, a commission. They're below the threshold on a weekly basis, um, but they do get paid a bonus uh, and or commission. And I think that's where the duty test um, has some layers of testing to determine. Is it discretionary, non-discretionary, the ability to earn it, when to get paid, how much of it is a portion of their salary, lots of different factors. Anything you would add to any of those um, to that question about, I, well, I get a paid a bonus and or commission as part of my job, but my weekly earnings is below that amount, you know, maybe each week. Yeah, I, th I think you're right, Phil. I think that we, we really do have to examine the duties test and also sometimes look at the highly compensated employee exemption as well uh, to determine whether that individual uh, is, is in fact exempt. And, and, and I think the point that I'm trying to make is, is that uh, the Department of Labor and outside legal counsel and AIM, we, we do take a, a, an individualized approach to all of this. Each position does need to be analyzed and evaluated to determine if it truly is exempt or non-exempt. Now, I will share one other thing for you, and this is a great uh, segue or follows in, in line with your question there, and that is that right now with the, this proposed rule change, uh, not well, sorry, not even proposed rule change anymore, the final the rule, rule uh, the final rule change, uh, now is a great time to conduct this examination of your uh, exempt, non-exempt status. And if you, there are changes that need to be made, a lot of times you can do this uh, under the guise of this new rule coming out. If your practices haven't been great uh, up until today, this is a great time to, to get on board and fix those things, to do an analysis and to make sure that you are properly classifying your employees. Yeah. All right. We got uh, just a couple questions here. I'm going to get to those and then we're going to let you get to your programming yep. uh, schedule there, Bert. Um, uh, let's see. Janine's asking the question, uh, do we need to comply by July 1st for the first step? That answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, we need to start working on that now. Even if there may be a holdup in court, we don't know that. So we want to be prepared. And the best thing to do there is Print a list of everybody who you have marked as salary not earning overtime and start the evaluation top to bottom. Uh, that's exactly how we do it. Some are really easy to say yes to. They're, they're fine. They're, they're, uh, they're not eligible for overtime and others are not as easy. Yeah. Um, and, 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 also, and also a follow on to that, Phil, it's a good time to update job descriptions uh, because that, that's a, a significant piece of the analysis. That, uh, yeah, that works hand in glove, right? That's one of the first things they're going to do is ask for a job description and, and crafting those the right way is uh, sometimes skillful and purposeful, um, you know, to have the right reflection of the job. And then the second part of this is, um, is it lawful to have part-time salaried employees who only work, uh, let's say, 24 hours a week? It is, and there's a way to, to handle that Calculate properly, that. but yes, That's exactly. That's right. Okay, very good. All right, Bert. Hey, we're going to let you go. You've had 277 right. practice episodes right here on This Week at Work. So you go show them how Thank it's you. done, Bert. Happy to do that. And we're going to get uh, right over to you, Eric. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Um, Eric, uh, you spent a lot of time in, in the town I'm broadcasting from, St. Louis, with the, as the headquarters of Enterprise. You find yourself in Connecticut, retired, and you've been called upon for your expertise and said, hey, you know what? Um, I'm getting enough calls. I, maybe I got something here people are interested in. Um, and tell me a little bit more about your journey, how you've come to being an author of a book and doing the consulting that you're doing. Yeah. So uh, always, always fascinated with business. My father was a textile salesman. My, my mother was a teacher. And I used to overhear my dad when he would come home from a long road trip. And I'd hear all the ebbs and flows of business. So I was always fascinated by it. I was fascinated back in the 80s when the U.S. Olympic team gets a group of amateurs together to do something special and win a gold medal and went to school for business, landed with an amazing company called Enterprise 
uh, now called Enterprise Mobility, and was able to grow within a company. I was one of four learning all these lessons of what to do or what not to do, and was able to climb the corporate ladder to eventually lead a few hundred employees and become an executive of fortunately one of the most successful regions within the company. And I felt there was more to give. My dad one day told me, asked me, he said, Eric, there's got to be more to life than being a textile salesman. And I felt there had to be more of the life than just what I was doing. And I felt I had something to give. I felt I had a message of impact to deliver. I felt it was the difference between what our team was doing versus others. And it was culture. And it was this catalyst to execution. And so I created an outline and stories and interviews. And next thing you know, a, a book comes out from it. Okay, great. Now, was was this something that like Enterprise said, hey, Eric, here's your model, go deploy this model? Or was this something you you discovered in your leadership uh, journey? How I mean, how did you develop this most one of the more successful elements of the business and uncover, hey, culture is what's really driving this maybe more than some other factors? Yeah, uh, lessons learned and then research and information. When someone tells you that engagement leads to great outcomes, you want to try to uncover what that might look like within the fabrics of an organization. And so I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, was really, you know, lessons learned either in enterprise or many lessons outside from mentors outside of really reaching and always trying to figure out what could be next, what could we do for our team to do something special? And you kind of take a blend of everything. And the way I phrase it is enterprise actually gave me the car when I was there and it was my job to drive that car and, yeah. uh, and utilize my team to help really align everything. So one of the things um, in your book um, you, you just talk about is um, that the, um, the journey of culture is often misunderstood. What what do you mean by that? Yeah. So when I was even doing a lot of the research and I would go ask, you know, first of all, what does culture mean to you and how can you measure it? It was usually, you know, they thought it was the soft, philosophical, hugs, high fives, rousing speeches. And I'm not saying those aren't important. I bet those are important. But you, you would have loved our program a, a week or a week ago or so. We had Craig Barube on, who was the coach of the St. Louis Blues when they won the Stanley Cup. And we had the uh, the little video clip of his pregame speech on game seven in 2019 when they won the Stanley Cup. Um, and it, it was quite um, quite motivating. It's more than PG-13 for this program. <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, th I mean, that goes so far, doesn't it? Right. Well, they always say motivation gets you started, habit keeps it going. And what I loved about culture, it was truly the shock absorber during the difficult time. So not during great times, uh, like Coach said, you know, th that big moment, you know, those times where things aren't going well and you have your team, your captains, in this case, his, his captains of the team being what I would call culture carriers and bringing everybody together in order to achieve something quite unique. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So when you talk about, um, and and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this at the leadership conference next week on Friday when, when I take the stage about culture being intentional. Um, tell us a little bit of, of what you mean when you say culture should be intentional. That's, that's an obvious, we'll go, well, of course it should, but, but it's not always intentional, is it? No, I, I'll listen, a lot of things, good things can happen unintentionally, unintended. I'll give you an example of intentional. So with, within an organization that was struggling with customer service, and we're searching for answers, we're reaching out to what we would call our think tank, our leaders of the region to come together and figure out what's going on. We, we flatlined, we're heading into a busy season. And all of a sudden we, we regroup and we find this video online and I won't share too much of the story, but it was about Johnny the bagger. And it's this young bagger who has Down syndrome and all the ways that he transforms this grocery store chain. And so we took that video and said, man, that's what we're missing. We're missing that attitude, that effort and some of the behaviors that go behind it to put your personal signature on every interaction. And so we take that information and it becomes part of our new hire training class. So anyone who would ever come in views what Johnny the bagger looks like. Then it's kind of put into every 
piece of the employee journey along the way as a reminder of what it's like to be a Johnny the bagger and truly make a difference. But yeah. it doesn't stop there. It then goes into the employee reviews and are you a Johnny the bagger? And we don't stop there. We would put it into one of, we always say we want to- Well, that's the question. Are you, are you a Johnny the bagger? That's, are that's you, the question. Yeah. Are, yeah, are you, that's a great question. Yeah. Well, and then, but we, we, we then reward it. And so when okay. I say intentional, you know, now all of a sudden you have these weekly meetings to say to your point, are you a Johnny the bagger? And yeah. you vote on it. The ones who have the most votes have a chance to win an award. And all of a sudden, it's very intentional. It goes from this concept of a video. It's now throughout the employee journey. And it's a behavior that you can coach. Very intentional. Yeah, that's a, that's, I, that's a great story and one I can, I can remember. So thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into Johnny the Bagger a little bit myself. Um, all right. So this, let's break this one into three areas here. How do you make culture practical, executable, and repeatable? I know you talk a little bit about that. Right, let's just start first with practical and then go to executable and repeatable. Yeah, I mean, practical is, is you know, coming up with what we would call the hourglass. You know, it is a practical approach that organizations can use. So, I mean, I believe it's on the screen here now where you'll actually, you now, first of all, it, it's called hourglass, right? Because O-U-R is in the word. So it's our, it's bringing everyone together, not an eyeglass like I've had since I was I got it, yeah. seven years old. Um, and so you'll see there are five stages along the way. The first is really in my first chapter is a listen, observe, and learn mentality, which is the discovery. We just had, uh, you know, some attorney talk and then, you know, they do the discovery period. You're, you're going to your clients, customers, stakeholders, employees, and you're pulling all of this information and asking important questions about whether it's initiatives or things that are upcoming with challenges and struggles. You then, as you pull all that stuff, it comes out of the hour, you're orchestrating the information. It becomes the plan, I guess you'd say, and there's the rollout. So all this stuff gets synthesized into the rollout. There's three to five key initiatives, some call them non-negotiables, commitments of what you're going to focus on. And then as you focus on it, it's really the reinforcement and training. The hourglass comes out. You now got to get everybody to truly understand what's going on within the organization. And that is the, again, training, reviews that it's put into place. And then, and then it lands, the, the, the sand lands on the bottom. And now it's time to assess approach. How are we doing? Whether it's a pulse survey, engagement survey, numbers sometimes tell a story. And you then, right when you think you have it, of course, Phil, you know what happens. Yeah. Something, technology, you know, something unexpected. Something changes, right. You, you, you turn the hourglass over and figure out where you are in that process. But two other important things with the hourglass, you notice there were two boundaries, two pillars on each side. Mission, vision, values will be one of the guiding uh, to all your decisions and policies and procedures. And those are going to guide you through the decisions that you'd make within an organization. So it was a very simple, practical approach that people could visualize, understand un from the new hire all the way to the person who's about to retire. So, yeah. And very repeatable, right? I mean, it's, it's the process in that. And, you know, one thing that we, we focus on a lot here, I mean, we, we will train 15,000 people uh, annually uh, across the U.S. And that training is uh, often so misunderstood by employers. And what I mean by that is so often employers will say, oh, train my supervisors, I send them over or train my leaders or this person's got a challenge. Can you help them with some training and upskill them? And then you never see them again. It's never talked about. They don't. They don't send the next new guy back, and that's going to affect your hourglass um, and that repeatable element of how we do training. How did you overcome that um, when you were a leader? Was that something that um, was a consistent part of the model you were deploying? Uh, yeah, and, and it's interesting looking at the poll and uh, the right materials, equipment, and information, that that was everything. I mean, if cultures are behaviors, you can train behaviors. And so it was very mindful that anytime we come up with a new initiative, you cannot just throw something out and assume it's going to stick. You have to have touch points along the way. Everyone will understand it's slightly different, but from the new hire up, you've got to implement the Johnny the Bagger into all these different touch points. So training was everything. And there would be initiatives that would support the training. 
And so we would, under each of those five factors, Phil, there would be three initiatives within the organization that we would expect people to support it with. And so, uh, again, going on very intentional. Yeah, no, that's good. In fact, I want to stay on that poll question because I, I find this interesting. We always invite our guests to comment on the poll question. Um, I, I think um, when I when I look at this poll results, I'd like to get your opinion. I think, you know, strong relationship with the manager. I definitely agree with that. The majority of people say clear communication of expectation and goals. Uh, you know, there's no wrong answer here, uh, but I do find it interesting. The right materials, equipment, information, um, the skills that might be needed, what might fit within that in order to do those first two that got the majority of the votes. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in your take on the, the overall results here. Yeah, I am. Well, again, I think you're right. They're all they're all very, very important. I When I go reach out to people and say, what's prohibiting you from? It usually uh -huh. is, I don't feel I have the support. I don't feel I have the right information in order to be successful. And so I'm surprised that that would be uh, on the light side. Yeah, yeah. I think I find that because that involves to me the skills, the right information, the tools. Do I have the right tool sets in order to do some of these things? But uh, Eric, how can someone get a copy of your book? Um, and is there another way that people can follow you and, and learn more about what you have going on? You can go a variety of channels. You can go on Amazon. Uh, it's at a Barnes & Noble near you. I was fortunate to have every state of Barnes & Noble carrying the book, so that's pretty exciting. Congratulations, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, at, at a bookstore near you, uh, people want to get a hold of me. Certainly LinkedIn is probably the easiest platform uh, to reach me at, but I'm also on Instagram or an email at eric at clearpathventures.com. Well, that's great. Uh, I'm glad to hear your success with Barnes & Noble. You know, I wrote a book, I think it was back in 2000 and maybe 14 or so um, called Leadership is Simply Complicated. And uh, I've had one person read some of it. My wife read some of it. She read about half of it. It's still sitting there waiting for her to finish it. So that's a great success. Eric, I, I wish you all the best uh, in your journey and impacting culture. Uh, to me, it's the number one thing we can do um, as leaders to help uh, the challenges that we're having with retention, recruiting, and our really our ability to pay. I still think culture is a part part of that. Um, so I'm uh, happy to see you're out fighting the fight, Eric. It's great to get to know you. Appreciate you being a part of the program. We will be back here next week at 7.30, uh, I guess Thursday, 7.30 Central Time, uh, one day before the Leadership Conference. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Until then, go out and let's go be good to somebody. Take care. Thank you once again for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link, aimea.org forward slash This Week at Work, or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment. LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're everywhere you are. Don't forget you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.org. We'll see you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.